But if you try to get those three things, animal protein, fruits and vegetables, and a good quality fat in there, you would be, I think, 80% of the way to having a really healthy diet. Welcome to the Hunt Pack Country podcast presented by Exo Mountain Gear. This podcast and the gear that we produce at Exo Mountain Gear share the same purpose to make you a more capable, confident, and successful backcountry hunter. Straight to the point, no fluff, and no BS. This show is all about providing you with valuable information from experienced hunters. To learn more about the podcast or about our backcountry hunting packs, please visit exomountaingear.com. In this, episode 84, we welcome Heather Kelly back to the show. Heather is an entrepreneur, a backcountry adventurist, and a nutritionist. A year ago, we had Heather on the show to talk about some of the products that she has with Heather's Choice Adventure Meals, as well as learn a bit about nutrition. We have received a lot of questions since that episode, and we wanted to get Heather back on the show to discuss some of that. Heather answers many questions for us in this episode, such as what are the easiest diet changes that provide the highest benefit? Are carbs really evil? Where do most people go wrong when it comes to backcountry nutrition? What supplements, if any, should one be taking? And much, much more. As important as nutrition is for a backcountry hunt, that's maybe three days or five days or 10 days out of the year. So we also talk about year-round nutrition as well. Some of you guys might not be into this, but I tell you what, it's important. It's important for us all. Since I've been dialing in and experimenting with my nutrition over the last several years, it has made a massive, massive difference, not only in my hunting, but in my quality of life. So I encourage you guys to listen to this one, take it to heart, and start to make some changes. See what your body responds to and see what works for you. Before we get to the show with Heather, we want to send a shout out to Jared Frost, Thanks for the iTunes review, Jared. We want to send you some Exo Mountain Gear swag, so please email us with your shipping information to podcast at exomountaingear.com. Listeners, if you're enjoying the show, we would love to see a review from you in iTunes or wherever else you might be listening to this, and you can always contact us directly by email with any questions, comments, or feedback to podcast at exomountaingear.com. We love hearing from you guys, and when you guys do this, you will be entered into future giveaways. Okay, let's get to the show, episode 84, with Heather Kelly from Heather's Choice. Heather, welcome back to the Hunt Back Country podcast. Thanks again uh, for joining us the second round. Yeah, thanks for having me. It's good to be back. Yeah. So to uh, kick things off, you know, we're, we're going to hit a wide range of, I think, topics and questions and aspects of nutrition, both from a day-to-day perspective, as well as, you know, getting into specific nutrition and food topics for backcountry adventures, I'm sure. Um, But just to throw a complete curveball at you, um, what did you have for dinner? Oh, I haven't had dinner yet. It's uh, six o'clock here in Alaska and it's Taco Tuesday. So it's going to be salmon tacos after this. (laughs) Nice. Is that your own recipe? Yeah, we have a freezer full of uh, sockeye salmon from dip netting last year, and you would think year old fish wouldn't be that good, but man, with a little bit of cilantro and hot sauce, it's actually killer in corn tortillas. Awesome. Do you um do you vacuum seal that stuff? Yeah, we have kind of the little chintzy food saver, and I think at one point we had three of those damn things just trying to keep up with sealing uh, yeah. 70 different fillets, but we'd like to invest in a like a really nice $3,000 backpacker at some right. point. I just yeah. can't quite uh, bring myself to do it just yet. Yeah, wow. So for guests that haven't caught the first episode with you, because that was, I think, over a year ago now. Um, and I know that we have a ton of new listeners, many of which actually do go back and listen to old episodes. So hopefully they've caught on, but we don't need to get into your whole story because we covered a good portion of that. But just go ahead and give us a quick rundown on uh, Heather's Choice and your history uh, briefly. 
Sure. So I was born and raised here in Bird Creek, Alaska, and was fortunate to be raised on really healthy, good food. So that kind of set me up for success in a lot of ways. And in August of 2014, I decided I wanted to start my own food line called Heather's Choice. And the idea was that I wanted to combine everything that I had learned about sports nutrition from being a college athlete and a CrossFit athlete and a nutrition coach for a long time. I wanted to combine that with the kind of logistics of pack rafting. So a lot of times here in Alaska, if we're going on these backcountry trips, we'll be putting a boat and a life jacket and a dry suit and a helmet and a throw bag and all this stuff in a 65 liter pack. And then you put all your camping gear in there and suddenly there's no room for food. And so Heather's Choice is really born out of necessity of trying to pack a lot of high quality food into a very small space. So I started the business with a small five tray uh, home dehydrator and launched a website and it's been taking me for a ride ever since. So the business has continued to grow at a rapid rate and it's forever entertaining and it's really thanks to the hunting community that business has really taken off for us. And I've been able to move into a full-time position with the company. That's so so cool. I knew that you started without commercial equipment, but I didn't realize it was just a little small five tray dehydrator. That's wild. Dude. I had a, I think at one point I had five crock pots and five Nesco snack masters. Wow. And it was just a flipping joke. Every time an order came in, I was like, no, (laughs) I wanted to do anything else besides cook food today. (laughs) Oh man. So since we last spoke, I actually picked up a dehydrator and have started, uh, messing with some recipes and things like that for myself, which we can get into later. But my dehydrator is bigger than a five tray. So I kind of have no excuse to start (laughs) Mark's choice now. Right. (laughs) Yeah, exactly. It's funny. I've had a couple people like, take some of the recipes I've posted on the journal of mountain hunting and put it in a quart size Ziploc and then tape a label on there. Like Sean's choice adventure meals. And I'm like, be careful, dude, that's uh, you're going to get started down this road and there's going to be no turning back. <laughs> yeah. I think that's interesting. Um, because you have shared recipes and you have given out good information on enabling others to make their own meals, which, you know, some might look at as uh, potentially losing some sales for yourself. But I mean, you've been really, um, I think, helpful in kind of getting folks out there to kind of explore on their own, which is really cool to see. Yeah, I hope so. Because dehydrating food is, as you know, it takes a lot of time. So for somebody to dehydrate all their own food for even a three day trip, it's going to be probably a week of dehydration time and being pretty committed to it. So I feel like if people can dehydrate their own bars and snacks and some of their own meals and then pepper in some Heather's Choice meals and snacks as well, that will actually make it feasible for them to dehydrate some of their own food for their trips. Yeah. Awesome. Well, we we might get into a bit more on that later, but uh, it's it's super cool. I want to know, since we last spoke, so in the past year, what has been... um, the biggest change or some of the biggest changes with Heather's Choice, whether that's from a business perspective or product or what just kind of sticks in your mind is changes uh, from the past year since we spoke? (laughs) Uh, Honestly, I feel like a lot has changed. So I was invited to join an accelerator program in the spring of last year. And an accelerator program is this idea that you take these young businesses, maybe businesses that haven't even sold their first product, their pre-revenue, and you put them through a three to six month mentorship program and then give them a small capital infusion to kind of give them the money they need to get started. And going through that process completely changed uh, everything about the way I look at my business. So when I spoke to you guys a year ago, I wasn't even full time with Heather's Choice yet. I was still juggling nutrition coaching and then also getting these orders out the door where now we've grown to the point where we have a location here in Anchorage, which makes it really convenient for customers to come and pick up their orders from us. We do order fulfillment six days a week now from this location, which is really nice for people who are trying to get their food in a timely manner. 
Uh, we have a team of three full-time people and a newly added shop dog, which is really fun. <laughs> <laughs> and the business has just become, it's become a business and no longer just a hobby. So I feel like that's a pretty big difference. Yeah. Was that uh, incubator program, is that something that woke up in Anchorage or something you did remote? How did that work? You know, it was actually the first cohort of Launch Alaska. And so it's an Alaska-based accelerator program. This summer, they'll be bringing on the second cohort. And originally, they wanted it to focus on Arctic energy. And ultimately, food kind of ended up fitting into that. You know, part of what we're trying to do here with Heather's Choice is to teach people how to dehydrate their own food and help them create a sense of self-sufficiency. And in a place like Alaska, where 95% of our food is imported, I feel like this is kind of the perfect place to teach people those skills or get people excited about dehydrating food. Because if anything was ever to happen, you know, with those barges that are headed up every single day, we would suddenly be in this food desert if it was winter time. So I feel like just having a little bit of uh, self-sufficiency is really important living in a place like this. Hmm. That's interesting. I mean, just the fact of 95% of the food being imported, uh, it, it's not surprising when you think about it. It's obviously clearly not a great place to go grow produce year round in Alaska by any means. But at the same time, you think of Alaska and you think of this uh, self sufficiency and sustainment. You think of all the wild game. So it's interesting to hear that, at least at a kind of a commercial or consumer level, that 95% of the food is imported. Yeah, it's pretty wild. And you would think that, oh, everybody's going and, you know, catching fish and hunting and, like you said, just kind of doing the subsistence thing. But even if we go and get 35 salmon for our household, you know, that might be 70 meals for us throughout the year. So for two people, that really doesn't cover a lot of the protein that you need for an entire year's worth. Mm -hmm. What What is... Uh... What are certain products um, that are produced there, um, whether that's, you know, again, more on a growing a vegetable side or more on a farming side? Like, what are some of the things that are um, self-provided up there in Alaska that don't come from hunting or fishing resources? You know, we actually have close to 24 hours of daylight in the summertime, so we can grow some big vegetables. Yeah. It's kind of <laughs> wild. And I love going to the state fair and seeing the, you know, 2000 pound pumpkins every year. That's pretty exciting. So in the summertime, we can grow a lot of root vegetables. So that's where you see a bunch of carrots and beets and potatoes and things like that at the farmer's market. But then additionally, there's tons of zucchini, there's eggplants, there's tomatoes, bell peppers. Like if you went to the South Anchorage farmer's market or the Fairbanks farmer's market, you would see a plethora of stuff. But I feel like if people aren't making a conscious effort to put those things up, you know, to stock up in the summer months when things are in season and then canning or dehydrating or blanching and freezing, then come winter time, you're super limited. So I feel like there's a very short window of opportunity for us to have a little bit of food security or to make a concerted effort to prepare for the nine month long winter that we have. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Interesting. So let's, let's transition a bit. And uh, if we could kind of put on your role as a nutrition consultant and coach that you've mentioned that you've done in years past um, and just kind of hopefully provide some helpful information, some for listeners out there um, to tie it into context kind of describe, I don't know if you want to say describe your average customer or just describe some of the the customers that come to Heather's Choice, maybe specifically from the hunting side and where they're coming from, from a, a nutritional or fitness perspective. That's a great question because it's really across the board. So this year, it was really interesting for us to go to the Great Alaska Sportsman Show. And that's kind of a I want to say a redneck crowd and there's a lot of flannel and overalls and people looking to buy four wheelers and ATVs and whatnot. And it was really incredible for me to see all of these 
kind of older Alaskan guys coming up and saying, whoa, this stuff is gluten-free. Like I now have to be gluten-free. My doctor said so. So your products would really help me out because I'm brand new to a gluten-free diet. Or on the flip side, we might have hunters that come up and are like, hey, you know, I'm fully keto and the packaroons really help me on these long trips because I need something that's really high in fat, but moderate in carbohydrates. So we get people just all across the spectrum. And I feel like the majority of customers that we have are people who eat well at home and are pretty dialed in on their nutrition plan. And now they're just looking for a solution that's going to fit into their healthy diet while they're in the backcountry as well. Okay, perfect. What would you say is um, for the guy who's maybe still figuring out things, even at home, not even concerned with backcountry nutrition yet, but just really trying to to figure out what works for them, maybe, you know, get in better shape, such shed some pounds in time for season and really just, you know, take the more um, average guy on an average diet. What's what are some of the things that come to mind in terms of the lowest hanging fruit, the biggest bang for the buck in terms of changes that you should either make or try or just at least look into? What are some of those things that come to mind from your uh, you know history as a nutrition consultant? Sure. The big red flag that I see for a lot of folks is that they're typically eating way too many carbohydrates. And I might be repeating myself from last time, or you guys maybe have heard this before, but a lot of times when people are carrying excess weight, especially around their midsection. So if you kind of get the the spare tire effect, or you feel like you just kind of have the, the gut that just won't go away, a lot of times what that signals is that you have some sort of insulin resistance. So you maybe have eaten a lot of sugar over a lifetime and you've been having your body produce a lot of insulin in response to the sugar that you take in and sugar and carbohydrates are interchangeable just in case I lose anybody. But whenever you eat a carbohydrate, your body has to respond by releasing insulin And insulin's job is to go grab that sugar from your bloodstream and then carry it to the door of a cell and knock on the door and say, hey, I've got a package for you because you're going to want this sugar in order to create energy and to fuel whatever activity you're doing. But the problem is, is that people are eating sugar in such excess that insulin is starting to go and knock on the door of the cell and nobody's answering. And so suddenly your body has this excess sugar that it has to deal with and it can't stay free floating in your bloodstream because having high blood sugar can be pretty toxic for people. So what it'll do then is it takes that sugar and converts it into fat. And this is a really smart system of the body because it's basically protecting you from having high blood sugar, which can be detrimental. And it's storing that energy for a later date which I think is why a lot of guys say, oh, I went and I did a 10-day elk hunt and I lost 15 pounds. And my first question is, well, did you have 15 pounds to lose? (laughs) You know, were you basically stockpiling energy for months in advance of this trip? You know, it's not necessarily always a bad thing that you're losing weight when you're on these really big epic trips in my mind. So, you know, really focusing on your carbohydrate intake and maybe testing to see how well you do tolerate carbohydrates based on your body composition, your workouts, all of those things. I feel like that would be the kind of my soapbox. If I had one thing to say to people, pay attention to how much sugar you're taking in on a daily basis, whether that's from whole grains or it's from sodas or fruit or potatoes you know, carbohydrates come from a lot of different foods. And so it's really easy to get an excess of them. Yeah. Okay. So as follow-up questions uh, to that, or I guess to elaborate on the topic, a few things come to mind. Um, One is if we could talk about different carbohydrate sources and what might be a quote unquote good or bad, Although I know in the end, a lot of things get, as you mentioned, broken down into sugar. But let's talk about the quality of carbohydrates, if we could, for a little bit. Um, And then I would love to, after that, um, get into maybe some of the timing issues and then kind of 
the quantity issues it's in terms of, as you mentioned, being related to activity. But kind of first, you know, what are some of the more, I guess, friendly or quote unquote good carbohydrate sources that you do recommend people have in their diet um, for people who aren't going to go strictly ketogenic and go incredibly, incredibly low carb? Yeah, great question. And just to throw it out there for the folks who do keto diets, like hats off to you. I haven't coached a ton of athletes who have had the diligence and the commitment to really pull that off. So the nutrition plan that I recommend for people is way more moderate on carbohydrate and protein and fat intake. But for people who can stay committed to that, again, hats off to you. It takes a a certain type of human to be able to stay on top of that stuff. And I guess, so for, then, sorry to interrupt Heather, but for context, I guess for listeners who aren't aware, ketogenic meaning incredibly low carb for most people, it's probably under like for sure under like 50 grams of carb, a lot are even lower than that, right? Exactly. So ketogenic diets are exceptionally therapeutic. So you can use it as a tool for somebody who's struggling with diabetes or with insulin resistance. It can also be a performance booster for uh, really long and, uh, less intense endurance activities. So you might see somebody who's a running a hundred mile race and they're fully keto because they're making sure to keep their heart rate at a manageable, uh, level so that they can go that distance for that long. And typically ketogenic diets are also protein restricted. So that's a lot of times the mistake that people make when they embark on a ketogenic diet is they just eat a bunch of meat when in all reality, your body can take that excess protein and convert that into sugar. And so you might be consistently struggling to actually get into ketosis because your body is producing sugar from your own protein stores in your muscles or from the protein that you're eating on a daily basis. So your diet might be 80% fat, and 10% protein, 10% carbs. You know, there's a lot of different ways to slice and dice that. But if people are looking to read more about it, The Art and Science of Low Carb Performance is a fantastic book to pick up. Okay, awesome. Hopefully we didn't lose too many folks there. <laughs> yeah, they're like, good. <laughs> yeah, that doesn't sound good. Yeah, okay. So as you mentioned, though, you don't necessarily advocate that for many folks, um, and you're more moderate carb. So let's get back to that, sorry, original question that I asked, and then I diverged us from, which is, what are some of the better, better carbo- carbohydrate uh, sources to include in our diets? Sure. For carbohydrates, just your fruits and vegetables. Honestly, you can get a ton of micronutrient content from fruits and vegetables, obviously eating your colors. So eating the orange vegetables and the purple ones and the red ones, and the blue ones, all of that. And what people maybe don't realize is that something like a sweet potato, you know, let's say a hundred grams worth, I'm going to say off the top of my head is going to be close to like 40 grams of carbohydrates, which is equivalent to say one or two slices of bread, depending on the bread. But again, if you're eating an orange sweet potato, there's a lot more micronutrient content for the same amount of carbohydrates that you would get from a slice of whole grain bread. So that's where I really encourage people to focus on dense sources of carbohydrates like your roots and tubers, but then as many leafy greens as you can stand. And then fruit also is a really dense source of carbohydrates. So an apple will have 30 grams of carbs, similarly to a slice of bread. So that's where you can, when we talk about nutrient time and you can play around with whether you're eating dense carbohydrates from roots and tubers, or you're mixing in fruit, And then from there, I encourage people to look at the least processed foods that they can get. So always looking at whole foods as opposed to processed foods like white bread. And the reason for that is because you get a more intense spike in your insulin levels when you eat something like a white piece of bread, because it doesn't take much for your body to digest that. And so that sugar gets assimilated way quicker. And so you have a much harsher rise in insulin, which can result in a blood sugar crash hours later. And I'm sure that you guys have probably experienced that before. It's like giving candy to a kid 
watching him get super jazzed <laughs> and then watching him crash an hour later. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. So fruits, vegetables, again, some of the, the root based carbohydrates with the higher micronutrients and obviously by micronutrients we're referring to vitamins and minerals uh, and things like that. When you mention recommending a more moderate level, I know that this is individual and there's many variables that go into this, but give us a context or a range of what might be uh, considered a moderate level of carbohydrates. Sure. I really recommend anybody who wants to learn more about this to pick up the book, The Primal Blueprint. That was kind of the the book that sort of sealed the deal for me. It's by a gentleman named Mark Sisson, who's more of an expert in any of this than I will ever be. But he has a really fantastic chart on his website that you can get for free, but it's also listed in the book and it's referred to as the carbohydrate curve. And so he shows on there that zero to 50 grams is basically being nutritional ketosis, 50 to a hundred grams. A lot of times is weight loss for people. So you're not taking in a lot of sugar and you're probably getting pretty well fat adapted. So if people are really trying to lose weight, then depending on your activity level, being in that 50 to hundred grams a day range range is a good way to peel weight off people pretty quickly. A hundred to 150 grams also kind of on the low end of things, depending on your body size. So if I had a girl who was five feet tall and a hundred and 15 pounds, a little thing, then maybe a hundred grams of carbohydrates a day is plenty for her. Where if it's a guy who's 250, you know, a hundred grams of carbohydrates, he might feel awful because he's just simply not getting enough sugar for the high intense activities that he's doing. So 150 up to say 250, I feel like that's a really good place for people who are doing uh, say one hour of training a day, especially CrossFit athletes, it's good to start them in there. But then you'll see that carbohydrate intakes start to go up, you know, 300 all the way up to 700 grams a day, depending on the type of athlete that you're working with. So once again, if you have somebody who is, you know, running 10 Ks every day, and then they're doing CrossFit in the evenings, you know, they might be able to tolerate 300 plus grams of sugar a day and not show any signs of insulin resistance. But for somebody else who has a day job sitting at a desk, 300 grams of carbohydrates would be a lot, and it's probably way too much for their lifestyle. So that's where reading that book to kind of go along with that chart would probably help uh, paint the picture of that a lot better than I can do in a couple minutes' time. Yeah, for sure. And then if we could just touch on timing as well, how much, uh, how much weight do you give the, the idea of carbohydrate timing in terms of timing carbohydrate intake around activity, whether that be before or after, or do you think that's um, just overanalyzing things? No, I think it's really freaking helpful. When I was working mostly in the CrossFit community, it was pretty darn critical that the athletes who really wanted to recover quickly and excel that they would have carbohydrates immediately after their workout. And for those guys, especially the ones who are trying to gain some lean muscle, we oftentimes would rotate in white rice as a really quick and easy digesting source of carbohydrates for them. So they might have maltodextrin, which is like a corn based carbohydrate with whey protein immediately after their workout so that they're drinking that before they're even done panting and sweating after their training. But then in the meal following that workout, they might be rotating in a great big cup of white rice with grilled chicken and zucchini and the works. So nutrient timing is absolutely important for people who are trying to perform at a high level. And on the flip side of that, you might find that somebody who wants to become exceptionally well fat adapted, they might do best coming into their workouts, not having had carbohydrates right before, because they're basically forcing their body to use whatever carbohydrates they have stored in their muscles and in their liver. So once again, creating really good insulin sensitivity and potentially 
forcing your body to burn a little bit of fat during that workout. But again, if I have an athlete who's strictly focused on performance and they don't want to lose any weight, we might be giving them easily digestible carbohydrates before and after their training sessions to make sure that they're never uh, going catabolic and that they're never feeling glycogen depleted. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. So I'd like to back up um, just to just to give an overview, especially for maybe the guys who are um, kind of lost in the specific numbers and things like that. I'd love to get your take on a, a spectrum of really making decisions. And so some guys who I'm sure are hearing this are all into it. They're into performance. They're already dialing their diet. They get what we're saying. They're looking to implement some of what we've talked about. Some guys are just overwhelmed by getting into the math or by tracking food or knowing exact grams of carbohydrates, things like that. You know, when I when I think of diet nutrition, I think of like a spectrum. And you don't have to, I think, make every decision right away and all at one time. And I think, in fact, the best thing you can do is make a process, a long-term process, and not go on like a crash diet, not do like a 30-day challenge, but figure out a way of eating that's sustainable and just gradually make better choices. And so for guys who are like more at the beginning stages of that, um, you know, I think, for example, you could just first focus on eating more real food, meaning less processed food. So when you talk about, um, you know, carbohydrate levels and then good carbohydrate sources being fruits and vegetables, you know, maybe that's just swapping out the chips for fruits and vegetables. At that point, we're not counting carbs. We're not worried about macronutrient ratios. We're just making better choices, right? So kind of on that spectrum of making decisions, I mean, where where should one start? Is it just on focus on eating real food first, then maybe worry about macronutrients and maybe micronutrients, then timing and get into those advanced topics? Kind of give us a breakdown on maybe taking somebody who's not super into nutrition yet and then walking them through kind of getting the ball rolling and how to make a snowball effect. Yeah, absolutely. I really like to start with just balancing people's plates. So that's where if you're sitting down to breakfast and let's say you typically eat oatmeal with blueberries and almonds and a glass of orange juice, and you might be thinking, okay, you know, I'm getting fruits and I'm getting my whole grains, but if you were to look at that and realize that the bulk of that is carbohydrates, I would ask you, you know, where are your dense sources of protein in this meal? Or what are the good healthy fats that you're incorporating? So I find that for a lot of folks, they're chronically under eating animal proteins. And the reason I love animal proteins is because they're the most biologically available and they're the most satiating for us. And people have maybe had that experience when you sit down and have a three egg omelet you know, that's a lot more satisfying and stays with you longer than say a bowl of cereal. So I like to encourage people to sit down and ask themselves, where is the dense source of protein that I'm having? What are the healthy fats that I'm incorporating into this meal? And then what sort of carbohydrate am I having? So that's where you can literally look at a plate and say, all right, I'm having eggs and I'm having breakfast sausage. I'm having an apple and a tablespoon of nut butter. Like that is a balanced plate. So that even in itself can take some practice, but if you try to get those three things, animal protein, fruits and vegetables, and a good quality fat in there, you would be, I think 80% of the way to having a really healthy diet. Mm-hmm. And just focus on that really for each meal, right? I mean, that that combination. Mm-hmm, for sure. Because what that does is it makes sure that you're getting enough protein to sustain your muscle mass. And without diving far into the numbers, let's just say if you eat three or four meals a day and you have a palm-sized portion of animal protein at that meal, that's going to be really important for appetite regulation, maintaining lean muscle mass, and maintaining nitrogen balance. And then the fats are really important for healthy hormone production and also for rounding out your calories. And then as we talked about, the carbohydrates are what are supposed to give you the energy to kind of push yourself during those workouts. So if I had somebody who 
wasn't training, maybe they were just walking for their form of exercise, we could pull out the roots and tubers and just focus on more of the leafy green vegetables and the lower carbohydrate fruits, you know, to really make sure that again, we're not giving this person too much sugar. So once again, stepping back, just see if you can balance your plate at every meal. That would be a huge success. Okay, cool. If someone starts to do that and maybe sticks with it for a bit, but they are not getting, say, the results that they're after, do you recommend folks get into, you know, counting calories, tracking food, keeping a journal, something like that? Yeah, I really strongly recommend that people use MyFitnessPal or some sort of phone app because we're really terrible at recognition. So if you ask me what I ate for breakfast today, I'd have to kind of like sit and think about it and be like, oh man, I can't quite remember how many handfuls of almonds I had or whatever the case may be. So tracking your food as you're eating it is really helpful or really helpful and really easy with a phone app like MyFitnessPal. And what people might find is that, oh, you know, the two handfuls of almonds that I'm having at lunchtime are accumulating to 500 calories. And it's a little bit eye opening for people because they don't realize how many calories they're actually taking in. And so that's where coming back to what you said about small changes, if somebody is not really seeing a lot of results, but they start tracking their food and they decide, you know what, I'm going to eliminate the two handfuls of almonds. Well, you just created a 500 calorie per day deficit, which would be, you know, you'd be losing a pound a week. You know, if you ran it off just the calories in calories out model. Mm -hmm. I think it's helpful to uh, just because <laughs> as you mentioned, most people have no idea what they're eating. And even if they do pay attention to what they're eating, meaning yeah, I eat some almonds every afternoon they don't fully recognize what that means in terms of calorie load and things like that. Um, I recommend doing it just for a while. I mean, it does sound burdensome. It is actually incredibly easy with something like my fitness pal. I did it for, I don't know, like a good stretch of six to eight months. And after doing that, I'm just so much more, uh, informed and can, tell more intuitively now what I'm eating and how much I'm eating. And that's a, not to say I'm perfect now, but you do have a totally different perspective after tracking food and understanding food um, by tracking for a while. Yeah, I, I do it every day just out of habit. And honestly, it makes me feel better about having a glass of wine at the end of the day. Cause I'm like, I budgeted for this. Mm, <laughs> you know? yeah. I was planning yeah. on having this and I skipped something else earlier in the day because I knew I wanted this. And I think that that's a really powerful tool for people to have rather than just trial by fire and changing too many variables at once and then getting frustrated that they're not seeing results. We want to take just a minute to thank Easton Archery for sponsoring this episode. Once again, just like last year, I'm shooting the Easton FMJ injection shafts. Last year, I did a lot of experimenting with the FMJs in terms of fletching. Tried all different kinds of setups. They flew great, and it was awesome. But I'll be honest. This year, I was on a time crunch, and when I ordered some of my shafts from Easton, I went ahead and got pre-fletched blazers, just as they come from the Easton factory. And I wanted to see how they would do. Now I've had some issues from manufacturers in the past getting pre-fletched arrows, and honestly I'm a bit OCD, so I tend to always do things myself, but these are actually flying outstanding. It's really nice with Easton's quality just to take an arrow right out of the box, not have to mess with it, cut it, glue your inserts, and be ready to go. It's that time of season, guys, where hopefully you're dialing it in, hopefully you're shooting broadheads, hopefully you're extending your range for practice, and a good arrow shaft makes all the difference. If you need some new arrows, be sure to check out Easton and their entire lineup. Can't recommend the Injection Series enough. What are your thoughts, Heather, on supplements? Because unfortunately, uh, well, I say unfortunately, I'm saying that from obviously a very personal perspective with some bias, but <laughs> unfortunately, that's where people tend to start. Um, you know... Uh, too often you see folks choosing supplements, uh, hoping to be a cure for what they're after and not making wise food choices like we've 
discussed. Um, do you think supplements are helpful? Uh, I mean, what's kind of your general philosophy on sub- supplements? Supplements are fantastic. They're just really, really, really powerful. So during my eating psychology coaching training, one of the things that we talked about was making sure people aren't taking an excess of five and at the most seven different supplements at a time. And the reason for that is because they are supposed to be supplemental to a whole foods, healthy nutrition plan, and they are really, really powerful messengers. So that's where I just really encourage people to focus on their diet first. And once you've kind of figured that out and you're feeling good, maybe we can see what happens if we add something like my personal favorite, which is magnesium. It's a, it's the most prevalent micronutrient deficiency in the country because it's really difficult to get from the food that we eat, but it really helps with muscle relaxation. So taking magnesium at night before bed is a fantastic way to make sure you get good quality sleep. It also helps people with muscle cramping And then from there, maybe we would see about including some fermented foods or a high quality probiotic to make sure that your gut bacteria are happy because we are actually more bacteria than we are human, which is kind of crazy to think about. So you want to make sure all those little bugs inside of you are happy and healthy because that's going to influence everything when it comes to your health. And then from there, Vitamin D is another one that we don't get enough of. So it's, I feel pretty safe recommending high dose vitamin D to people. And then from there, it just runs this crazy gamut of what are you trying to do? So if you're somebody who's chasing performance, absolutely looking at things like branched chain amino acids and creatine, uh, supplemental whey protein, uh, additional fish oil, you know, you can spend an astronomical amount of money on that stuff and it can really help, but it doesn't matter unless you have, once again, that balanced nutrition plan that you're kind of standing on as your foundation. So it's not the first place that I go with people. Uh, it's typically the last thing that I'll do with an athlete that I'm coaching. Mm-hmm. Yeah, th- uh, interesting what you said about magnesium because, uh, I knew nothing about magnesium, but was having some cramping issues and then, you know, played internet doctor and tried to figure out what might help with my cramping issues um, and saw many recommendations on magnesium and have since started that. And my cramping has, you know, 95% vanished. It's been pretty amazing, actually. Really? That's awesome. Yeah, it was pretty wild. Like, I don't take much in terms of supplements. Um... I have in the past, especially on the performance stuff, but just kind of got sick of all the junk that's in most supplements. But magnesium is something that I continue to take. It's pretty cool. And yeah, again, that's, that's the, personal. I mean, maybe I was deficient and others aren't, but for me, it's made a major difference. Yeah, especially the raspberry lemonade flavor of Natural Calm. You can get that on Amazon. And it's just kind of that that trigger for me now that I take that at night and it's time to go to bed. So if people are struggling with good quality sleep, which is arguably more important than nutrition, you know, getting some sort of a routine and taking magnesium at night before bed can really, really help. And you'll, that in and of itself can help with your performance just because you are getting the rest that you need between your training sessions. And I even take little packets of it. They have single servings you can buy of natural calm and I'll take that into the back country every trip. Awesome. I haven't seen that, so I'll have to check it out for sure. So transitioning to backcountry trips, backcountry hunting adventures specifically, um, how does your outlook change? How does your philosophy change? How does your advice uh, for those listening change, if at all? It's not too much, just more calories. I find for a lot of folks who are coming in and asking about backcountry nutrition, And once again, it really starts with what are you doing at home? Because if you don't have that dialed in at home, you're definitely not going to dial it in for backcountry trips. So anything that you're going to do in the backcountry, you want to make sure you test it and test it and test it because you don't know how your body is necessarily going to respond to different foods. So if you have, let's say, 2000 calories at home of high quality foods, depending on the trip intensity and duration and the heat or the cold, 
you might be as much as doubling that. Or if you're climbing Denali or some other big mountain, then it might be closer to five or 6,000 calories a day. So taking in that many calories is very, very, very hard in your digestive system as is. So you want to make sure that those five to 6,000 calories are coming from foods that you already tolerate well. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. And I have a little bit of a bias towards fats for the backcountry just because they pack down really small. You know, we use coconut milk powder in a lot of our products because it has nearly 200 calories per ounce. And similarly with things like coconut oil and ghee or uh, nut butters, you just get so many good quality calories in such a small package that I really recommend that people get pretty well fat adapted by moderating their carbohydrate intake while they're at home. That way when they go into the backcountry, yeah, they may still increase the number of carbs that they're taking, but they don't necessarily need five, six, 700 grams of sugar in order to fuel their trip. Now it might be a much more moderate than that. And they may find that they actually perform pretty freaking well on a little bit higher fat plan because their body has become much more adapted to burning fat for fuel instead of solely relying on carbohydrates. Yeah. Yeah. It's interesting. Always keeping an eye on the weight and, you know, I've geeked out in the past for sure and made spreadsheets of food and tried to optimize my calorie per ounce ratio and all that stuff. And in the end, like the math is really simple and it comes down to one simple fact, the more fat, that is going to be in your diet, the more calories you're going to have for the weight. Like there's no way around it. Mm -hmm, For sure. And it's delicious. So it's a (laughs) win-win. Yeah. Score. (laughs) (laughs) So let's go ahead and kind of dive uh, into some of your products. And I'd really just love to hear kind of the philosophy, the purpose behind, you know, the product, behind the ingredients, behind what's selected, and not just see it for what it is if we browse your website, but really understand from you what goes into it and why. Um, And I guess we can just start, you know, with kind of some of the breakfast. So you have a few different variations on like a buckwheat breakfast. Kind of tell us about that, what it is, why you've chosen that versus something like a traditional oat-based breakfast, things of that nature. Sure. When I was first getting into ultralight backpacking, I was taking instant oatmeal packets and a packet of peanut butter and then maybe a scoop of whey protein, once again, trying to get that carb, protein, fat balance. And while that was fine, I found that a lot of times it just tasted chalky (laughs) or it was overly sweet. But then additionally, those calories that I was getting from instant oatmeal were burning off really fast. So it wouldn't be an hour to two hours that I'd be into my hike and I'd already be reaching into my snack bag. So I wanted to create something that was higher in fat and ideally had some pretty good uh, plant-based amino acids from things like buckwheat and hemp and chia so that you're getting some protein in the morning. It's not as much as I would like it to be, but once again, adding supplemental whey just isn't quite going to cut it. So you want some protein, some good quality fats. And then what I really like about buckwheat is that it's actually a seed and not a grain. And I've worked with a lot of athletes who are highly grain intolerant. So they might be full-blown gluten intolerant or their body just responds really negatively to grains in general because brain, not brains, grains can be uh, pretty tough on your digestive tract. And so buckwheat is a fantastic form of carbohydrates that also has essential amino acids and is a unrefined carbohydrate that's not going to spike your insulin the same way that a highly processed instant oatmeal would. So that's sort of the the science behind it is trying to create the perfect storm of a fairly balanced meal, but favoring fats because they're such a great dense source of fuel. And the idea is that the buckwheat breakfast should 
get you further down the trail before you have to reach into your snack bag than an instant oatmeal or some sort of quick oat option would. Awesome. And you have that in a, a handful of flavors with different fruits and spices and all that, right? Yeah, we have five different flavors of that and always wanting to release more. But once we really get to expand the adventure menu, I'd really like to do some heartier breakfast options. Like I keep threatening to do a shredded beef hash in a bag and I really hope that I can pull it off someday. (laughs) That sounds awesome. Cool. Let's uh, move on from that. uh, Kind of on the snack side of things, which is where so many folks go when they think of uh, backcountry nutrition because it tends to be so bar-based and, you know, all these different packaged foods or sports foods or whatever. Um, but kind of on that side of things, you have the packaroon. So, again, just kind of tell us about that, the philosophy, and, and all that goes into it. Sure. I find that there's a lot of fruit and nut bars out there (laughs) and eventually you can only eat so many of them. You know, especially there's just a lot of sweet foods that are easy to grab. And I wanted to create something that was really high in medium chain triglycerides, which is the type of fat that you get from coconut. And I think that type of fat is so fantastic because it gets metabolized for energy a lot quicker than other forms of fat. So when I was coaching CrossFit athletes, I'd have them take, you know, a tablespoon or two of coconut butter before their training sessions, knowing that that medium chain triglyceride was going to be metabolized and available for use as energy faster than anything else. Uh, Additionally, coconut is super dense. So our little coconut cookies, every two ounce pack, you're going to get 320 to 360 calories that fits in your pocket and they're kind of fun as a base you know like we take our base recipe of shredded coconut maple syrup coconut butter sea salt and vanilla and then we can make a ton of different flavors so right now we offer five different variations of those coconut packaroons but we're releasing three more this summer and i probably have close to 20 recipes So I have to make sure I don't release all of them at once and kind of titrate them out over time. Wow. That's wild. Yeah, it could be Uh, quite the lineup if you had 20. (laughs) Yeah, people would be like, oh my God, this girl's nuts. (laughs) So we'll probably rotate the flavors over time, which will be really fun. So that's kind of our, that's one of our best selling products is the coconut packaroons because they're good on or off the trail. Like if I have a really busy morning and I can just grab a cup of coffee and a pack of packaroons, you know, that's going to get me a couple hours of good energy because they are so high in good fats and they do have carbohydrates from maple syrup. But again, when you're pairing fats and carbohydrates together, the insulin spike isn't as grandiose. So you get better energy from that. And our next step as a business is that we would like to release some snack packs and do different trail mixes, but try to mix in some more salty, savory snacks for people so that we're not solely releasing just sweet foods. Because a lot of people on the trail will actually get a little bit of palate fatigue where they've eaten so many sweet things that they're just starting to grow this aversion to them. Like I just can't eat another candy bar. And so that might be the person who's really struggling to get in enough calories while they're out there is they just brought too many sweet snacks. And if they would just get something maybe salty and crunchy in there, suddenly their appetite would kind of return and they might be able to go back to some of the sweet snacks that they packed as well. So for people who are planning trips, try to get a good mix of sweet and salty to make sure that you're getting in enough calories while you're out there. Mm, Perfect. What are some of your favorite uh, snacks or things that you bring on uh, outdoor adventures that aren't in your product lineup? Oh my gosh. We don't leave home without ginger chews. Those little gin gins. Uh (laughs) Uh-huh. I I don't know what it is. It's probably all psychological, but we've brought those on some of our most challenging trips and have been in some, you know, kind of in that dark place and just 
popped a few ginger chews and just kept charging. <laughs> so <laughs> those little things are just fantastic. I love them. Uh, I tried to make a, a version at home that it's a fantastic recipe I'll share with you guys, but they are so unbelievably strong. So you could make <laughs> one batch and it'll last you for the rest of your life. Uh-huh. Um, we also really like Epic Bar products. So those bison bars and the lamb bars are really fantastic for getting that good source of animal protein. And we like to bring roasted salted nut mix. And that's just a really easy food. You can get a ton of calories from that. And then when we're feeling a little bit fancy, we'll bring like a really good hard cheese, like Parmesan or something like that. And if you slice that up really thin and pair it with salami and dried apple pieces, it's this fantastic little lunchy snack option that you can do. And then obviously lots of coffee and hot chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> of course. That's always there. It's not a camping sure. trip without that. <laughs> <laughs> what about your, so not excluding, uh, you know, an adventure specifically, what's your guilty pleasure? So we've talked about all these good nutritional decisions. What's your guilty pleasure? Uh, I don't know that I have too many guilty ones. Cause like I said, you know, I like to have a glass of wine at the end of the day and I just kind of schedule that in. I love a really good, uh, red wine. So I keep threatening to just pack it all up and move to Argentina and become a wine connoisseur. Uh, additionally, like a really good dark chocolate, probably something like 75% with cocoa nibs and cocoa nibs are they're a little bit bitter, but they give a nice crunch to a dark chocolate bar. And other than that, I don't think I have too many guilty things. I might drink a few too many cups of coffee on any given day, but that's about it. <laughs> I don't think you should too feel too guilty about any of the above. That's decent choices for sure. <laughs> um, I'm sure that you have some fantastic guilty pleasures <laughs> for food that you would share with people, though. Just to... <laughs> level the playing field here <laughs> oh yeah no actually all the above is good for sure um that said there's something about you know after uh, after a trip especially like just getting some straight up greasy non-healthy something in yeah it's funny it's become like a tradition with one of my buddies that i hunt with that for whatever reason like the timing of when we usually get out of the back country make it back to civilization um and for our out-of-state trips like we end up somewhere and it's always like 11 p.m. and nothing's open and we're starving and we haven't <laughs> eaten food you know in like a week other than what we've packed in so like the last few years it's ended up being dominoes and it's like the best dominoes of the year and probably you know not that i eat dominoes much but it's like become a thing so that's a certainly a hunting related uh guilty pleasure for sure yeah, which I can't believe I didn't throw this out there. We have a very similar experience where you're always coming back too late from trips. And the only place that's open is either our local bar called the Brown Bear or Chair 5, which we refer to as the Dive in Girdwood. And Buffalo Wings will always hit the spot. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's for sure. <laughs> What's something you believe about uh, nutrition now that you didn't believe a year ago or five years ago? Um, you know that it's, I think at one point in my life, I feel it felt like it was very black and white. And honestly, like that's what brought me to where I am today was searching for the right diet. Like there was one. And once I found it, I was going to be fixed <laughs> and I was going to be set for life. Uh, now it, I'm actually surprised like what I get away with, with my nutrition, because it feels very erratic just with my schedule. And I feel like my body's still just kind of hanging in there with me. So I feel like rather than overthinking your nutrition plan and letting it stress you out, there's really a lot to be said for having a bit of trust that you can, you know, it, you can accept and, just trust what your body's trying to tell you. So if you try to go on a super low carb nutrition plan and it is like pushing the cart up the hill with the horse in it, it might not be the right nutrition plan for you. 
So I really think that there's a lot to be said for developing a sense of nutritional wisdom and a sense of trust with your own body. Hmm. Yeah, that's good. I think one thing that's interesting is people who haven't uh, experimented, they don't necessarily know what good feels like because uh, unless you're paying attention, you just accept things for the way that they are. And it's only until you begin to pay attention and begin to make changes with intention that you can really feel a difference in how food affects you. But it certainly can um, if you're paying attention to it. Yeah. And I think that that's where, you know, getting to a point where you're healthy, that's when you probably can get just more attuned to your own hunger and fullness cues. And you can pay attention to kind of your blood sugar regulation and what are the things that are causing me excess stress and causing me to emotionally eat. I think you're spot on. If somebody is like way too far past that and they just have no sense of their hunger and fullness or their their own appetite, then yeah, you know, picking a place to start, like committing to balancing your plate every day. Once you kind of achieve this sense of health, then it becomes a whole lot easier to eat intuitively and to maintain a healthy body weight and a good level of fitness. So before we wrap up, let's uh, circle back to something we mentioned too earlier about some do it yourself dehydrating uh, knowledge. Um, Again, I'm, I'm completely novice. I'm playing and experimenting. Um, but at the same time... What have you been making so far? <laughs> well, that's what I was going to say. At the same time, it's it's been interesting to see that in, in some ways you kind of can't mess it up. Not that everything turns out great. Um, but, you know, it's a lot less uh, like scientific or formulaic than I thought it would be. Um, again, I'm not doing it at a commercial level like you are. So you're like, yeah, there's a science to it. But, you know, for me, it's like I was so intimidated thinking I was just going to screw it up or it had to be at at an exact temperature and an exact time. But I've discovered that there's more of like, um, you know, there is good temperature ranges for certain things. And then in terms of drying time, it's you can pretty much tell like when it's legit dry and ready to go. So in general, that's my first observation, but I've, you know, learned some things and you can, I would love to hear more about just kind of different helpful bits on like, for example, that leaner meats dehydrate better um, because fat, fattier meats, um, you know, fat can go rancid even when it's dehydrated. Um, It doesn't dehydrate as well. I should say what other kind of like, tidbits of wisdom do you have for those who are looking to get into dehydrating? Yeah, you're spot on with that, that your window of opportunity is quite large with dehydrating (laughs) because you might say like this recipe could take eight hours to dehydrate. It could take 24 because it's so dependent on the humidity in the room. It's dependent on how you cut the pieces of food Uh, It might be dependent on how thick you pour your fruit leathers. So it's really funny when I feel like you're reading a recipe book for dehydration and it'll literally have like eight to 24 hours as your drying time. (laughs) So it's very forgiving, I would say. Uh, Additionally, your point about striving for leaner sources of protein is fantastic And even if you have a fattier source of meat that you want to dehydrate, you can simply cook it and then rinse it. So you're rinsing the fat off of it, which I know is precious calories. But like you said, fats are so prone to going rancid that if you dehydrate a really fatty burger or uh, fatty jerky, you probably want to eat it right away because it's just not going to last very long. Uh, Additionally, I encourage people to really start looking at some of their leftovers and start playing around with putting those on the dehydrator. So if you make a big batch of rice and you're not going to eat it all before the end of the week, you can dehydrate it and make your own instant rice. And it's fantastic. Or taking things like salsa that you're not going to eat all of the jar and you don't want it to go to waste, pour that in the dehydrator trays and see how it turns out. So I think that dehydrated food has a, there's a real opportunity there to reduce food waste overall. And that's where if you get a less than perfect apple or you get 
a really mealy peach, you know, cut those things up and put them on the dehydrator because they suddenly turn into these super delicious treats that you can take on trips. You know, we're pretty uh, stuck with that here in Alaska that we don't have fantastic apples and all the apples that get shipped up, you know, a lot of times aren't very good. And if I buy a 10 pound bag of apples from Costco feeling hopeful that they're going to be good, but it turns out that they suck, I can just slice them up and then dehydrate them and turn them into apple chips. And we can eat that whole 10 bag of apples in a week. (laughs) Yeah. So it's, I just think it's so flipping fun and such a fantastic way to get creative with the food that you're already cooking and just throw it on the trays and see how it does. The only caveat that I would throw out there is that you want to be careful about mixing different foods in the dehydrator. So you wouldn't do necessarily salsa and peaches at the same time, unless you want your peaches to taste like salsa. (laughs) (laughs) So just do one thing at a time for starters. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. That's good stuff. That's, you know, some of the ways that I've started is literally just been with leftovers since like playing the game of, will this dehydrate? (laughs) (laughs) Exactly. Yeah. I mean, some things I, I knew would, or I thought would like one of my favorites has been, um, the elk chili that we make which is more of like a fiesta soup than it is a chili um you know dehydrating that and i've already tested rehydrating that a couple times it's turned out fantastic for sure Um, awesome as you mentioned just just doing fruit uh man freaking apple slices hammered with some cinnamon dehydrated oh so good my kids love it which is really good um yeah, it's, it's been fun to play with for sure. I will say like on the fruit piece specifically, I quickly realized that a, what is it called? A mandolin slicer? Is that what it is? Mm-hmm. Is invaluable versus trying to hand cut fruit. And then obviously not only does hand cutting it take a long time, but the more consistent your cuts are in terms of the thickness, the more consistent they will dry at the same time, obviously. So that uh, slicer was a great investment as well and you know cheap yeah for sure those things are fantastic like for dehydrating a, food yeah that's all new to me as a guy i'm like a mandolin slicer what is it you know, i'm like learning <laughs> yeah. kitchen instruments now <laughs> yeah just don't cut your fingers with those things mine still kind of intimidates me i'm like oh it's damn it i have to use the mandolin <laughs> yeah yeah They're certainly sharp. wicked sharp for sure <laughs> Steve, did we bore you? Did we lose you? Did He's we like, confuse uh, you? Yeah. Chlorophyll. Uh, that's, that's like the first podcast, uh, everything was just kind of over my head there for a while. So just chilling back listening. Um, yeah, it's funny. You know, I think there's a lot of stuff in there that I was just really learning from because, you know, I haven't dive, dove into my personal diet a lot. But I, I know I'm one of those guilty of eating a ton of carbs. Uh, and it's funny, what you're, Heather, you were talking about. I've, every once in a while I try to do like, I'm not going to eat carbs for a week, but I, I mountain bike or I hike every single day. Uh, and I, after like two, three days, I'm so drained of energy that I all of a sudden, like I need to eat an entire pizza. Uh, I just have that carb craving and I'm sure there's some weird insulin thing going on there that I've never really, uh, you know, dove that deep into to figure out what's going on. Um, but, uh, yeah, it's really interesting to hear. Uh, one thing I want to, we're doing the death hike here in two weeks. Um, and so Heather, it's a, we're basically going to hike 40 miles in oh, a 25 to 30 hour period. Is there any uh, tips for something like that as far as, I mean, we kind of covered some of it in there, but it's eating fats and I mean, should you be eating carbs before or should we completely not touch a carb from now till the hike uh, and just go <laughs> with fat? I mean, what, what would be a rough guideline? Sure. If you're somebody who is already doing a lot of carbohydrates, you know, especially to go do your daily activities, then you may actually want to carbo load a bit. So if you were my athlete, I would be telling you two weeks is too short a time to change anything. So just, just do your thing. And you probably want to have plenty of sugar while you're out there because your body is expecting that. Mm -hmm. If we were six to eight months prior to this event, you know, we might be looking at tweaking your nutrition plan and getting you a bit more fat adapted so that you could go at a pretty good clip during that. You might be at more of a, a moderate pace in order to sustain a certain uh, heart rate during that exercise, mm-hmm. but we would get you really good at burning fat for fuel so that you would have to potentially carry less food. 
So it just kind of hmm. depends on how far in advance that you start thinking about these different activities and you just, once again, test, 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 and whatever you do on your day hikes, that's just what you're going to replicate for the big game day. So for you, I would uh, definitely the night before plow down on some pizza so that you're ready to rock and roll. <laughs> Guess I can do that. Yep. Uh, I like that advice. <laughs> yeah, before and after, sandwiching. The nutrient timing is really important. <laughs> What about uh, awesome. like salts or electrolytes for something like that, Heather, with, you know, potential heat and, you know, a, a pretty much almost a solid 24 chunk of effort? Yeah, I'm a terrible person to ask because we don't sweat here in Alaska. It's, like, <laughs> it's just, it's always cold. And so we just don't, I don't, at least don't I personally haven't, yeah, dealt with that, except we did do one trip uh, that was awesome in the desert where, we hiked in this drainage called Keg Springs and hiked into the Green River and then pack rafted about 20 miles to Horseshoe Canyon and then hiked out. So it was about 54 miles over the course of, I think we were out of there in two and a half days. But that was one of my first experiences doing a backcountry trip in the desert in April and definitely started to get some heat exhaustion and just getting super loopy and getting weepy and feeling awful. So I feel like just staying really up on your hydration is important. And then that's why I love bringing salty foods like roasted salted nut mix, because those salty foods are going to help with that electrolyte replacement. Uh, since I use a camelback, I never want to fill that thing with a bunch of basically anything besides water. So it doesn't get sticky and weird. So I tend to just drink a lot of water and then eat uh, whether it's dried fruit or roasted salted mixed nuts or peanut butter packets, those things seem to be plenty for me. But I'm sure you guys have some different powders and potions that work well for you. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I messed around with, you know, like uh, new, uh, Noon or however you say it, N-U-N tablets, Goo uh, brand has some tablets, and I messed around with that stuff for sure on longer efforts. And I think it's, I think it's been helpful. Um, I haven't noticed night and day type uh you know experiences with it but you know when i did like a room to rim of the grand canyon and was facing triple digit temperatures things like that i took it and didn't have any issues so i can't say for sure that it was because of supplementing but um but yeah i think it, it can be helpful then to, to try and stay on top of them for sure what i think they help you drink more water too yeah so if that nothing else hurt. It, yeah if nothing else it breaks up the monotony yeah for sure I have a final question, Heather. We've mentioned fat adapted a few times. Um, I guess my diet's changed over the past year or so, and I've worked more carbs into my diet simply because I was in a position where I wanted to put on a little bit of weight. Um, and so I've paid, uh, uh, not paid less attention, but I've just been not as strict with um, my carbohydrate levels, keeping those in checks. But at the same time, because of my schedule, um, I pretty much work out exclusively first thing in the morning, literally within like 20 minutes of waking up. And I do that just fasted. Um, does working out fasted um, help fat adaption, even if kind of the my macronutrient profile is a bit different simply because I'm um, doing effort without many carbohydrates in my system? Yeah, we could take a peek at sort of what you're having in the evening hours. So it, depending on whether or not you're kind of carbo loading and then waking up and doing that effort, that would be kind of interesting to look at. There's a system called carb backloading that kind of, once again, goes into the nitty gritty of nutrient timing and would potentially advocate for doing something like that in order to keep you super lean because you're having those carbohydrates getting a serotonin release, it's allowing you to sleep really soundly at night, but then you wake up in the morning with full glycogen stores. So you can maybe kick ass at that workout. So I think it does still matter what you're doing outside of that training window with your nutrition, but without looking too closely at it, you're definitely helping to get yourself 
better at burning fat for fuel, but you may still be carrying plenty of glycogen into that workout, depending on what you're having in your evening meal. Yeah. Okay. Is there any science behind, uh, like how long, uh, carbohydrates would stay in the system? Ooh, that's a good question. I do not know the answer to that. My understanding is that it's kind of like a gas tank. So if okay. you fill up your gas tank by going and eating pizza, but then you're sedentary for the following week, you may have used up a little bit of that gas, but it's not all gone. And I think that that's why people have such a hard time with weight loss is because they are good for two or three days, but then they whack themselves with a ton of carbohydrates and their body doesn't know what to do with it other than store it as fat. So if you kind of yo-yo diet and you're good for two days, but then you're off the wagon for three days, it still just accumulates too quickly for you to stay ahead of it. Awesome. Heather, what what can uh, we share with our listeners who might have questions, just want to learn more about uh, the meals that you provide, want to check out what you're up to, any of that, where should they go? Definitely head over to heatherschoice.com. You can check out our full adventure menu there. We are pretty active on Instagram, you know, posting recipes, you know, for you guys to try out. We're also highlighting the trips that you guys are going on. That's the best part. So seeing what our customers are up to is fantastic. And then we just started doing a little series on Facebook where we're going to have a food fact Friday and it's a Facebook live where people can hammer me with their nutrition questions and I'll answer as many as I can in an hour. And that's a really fun experience for me because people have a ton of questions about nutrition. And if there's any way that I can be helpful, uh, it's very, very gratifying and very, very fun. So if you want to learn more about that, definitely opt in for our newsletter on the website and feel free to send questions uh, over at heatherschoice.com to me personally, or we also have a customer service email, we care at heatherschoice.com and all of the geeky nutrition stuff ends up getting filtered to me. <laughs> awesome. <laughs> That's perfect. I can imagine that there's uh, quite a few questions with uh, the variety of ground that we covered tonight. So that's perfect. Yeah, that'll be fun. See what comes up. Well, Heather, thank you so much again for joining us for part two. Yeah, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap on this one. We say it every week, guys, but we really do appreciate you tuning in. It's only because you guys are following along and interacting and supporting this show that we keep putting all of the effort into it. So thank you guys. We are recording a ton of episodes currently. We have so much content to take us through preseason and into season. So much good stuff to come, so be sure that you subscribe. Again, if you have any questions, want to know how to subscribe, want to learn more about the podcast or about Exo Mountain Gear, go ahead and visit exomountaingear.com forward slash podcast. Talk to you guys next week.